Revelations too. Revelation. I'm doing the same thing a lot of people do. I say Revelations. It's not Revelations, it's Revelation. Revelation 2. Verse 1, the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things say, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Verse 3, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from which you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, and I, which I also hate. Verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Seems like a great opportunity to pray. And Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, I would pray that you would just open this up before us, that you would reveal it, unveil it um, before our spirits, Lord. Um, the word is so precious and so true. It's intimidating to speak about it, Lord, but I feel like all we can do sometimes is mess it up. Lord, come speak to our hearts and speak to us in pure fashion, Lord, undefiled. Lord, I pray that we would hear your words and my words would fade away. In Christ's name, amen. There were seven letters to these seven churches, and the letters were written in a typical fashion, and uh, each letter begins with who the letter is addressed to, and then who is writing the letter. And in every letter, Jesus says, I know your works. Then there's a, a, a commendation and a joy spoken of. Then there's a criticism and a disappointment, uh, some call it condemnation. And at the end of each letter, Jesus alludes to his coming again. So you see this pattern of these seven letters and, and there's much spoken of these seven churches as if they were sort of periods of time through the church age. And, and you can sort of see that and study it, but I don't think you can make too much of that. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's a fascinating to look at, but I think in each case the letter is speaking to these churches more of uh, as, an, as an example for the church of all the ages. Because at the end of every letter, he's, he's, he addresses this uh, to the churches. This it's an offer and an opportunity to speak to all the churches. First, the first is Ephesus, no stranger to to John, who ministered there for for many years. So as John is writing down the letters that the Lord is speaking to him, he can probably see the faces of the people there. <clears throat> he knows of the situation they are in. He knows of the way they are treated in the culture and the government and those that are suffering and, and those that have went before them. And so as he writes this letter, I think, I think John is, is uh, it's very personal for him to write to these people. Uh, Ephesus was known as this church that left its first love. It was a major city in the Roman Empire, and, and it's referred to as a free city, which means it was allowed to rule itself, that Rome didn't interfere and appoint rulers within the city, but they were allowed to appoint their own rulers because they had uh, taken care of the Roman Empire. They had played along with the Roman Empire pretty nice, 
and they were always beneficial to them, so they were kind of left alone. And so this was a, it was a very old city, and, and you can look back and you can see when Alexander the Great conquered that, uh, that region, and, and uh, he actually had one of his generals came and moved the city of Ephesus closer to the port. It was a, away from the, uh, the harbor initially, moved it closer to the harbor, and it became more of a thriving uh, city as it developed on the harbor. Uh, all the nearby roads uh, sort of led to Ephesus. It was like a, a spider web of roads that, that came uh, uh, into Ephesus from all of that area. So it was like a central hub to, to that area. But on a bigger perspective is, is all of those roads also came from far away. And so all across Asia from Euphrates and Mesopotamia and from Colossae, Laodicea, kind of from the southeast, Galatia, by way of Sardis from the very south through this Meander Valley. And so a spider web of robes that, that, that went across a, a large region of what we would call today uh, Turkey and those surrounding areas. All of those sort of led back to uh, Ephesus. And, and these um, places, these, all these other regions found access to the Mediterranean by way of Ephesus and the harbor at Ephesus. And so you can imagine that Ephesus had many cultures, many people, many religions, many temples, many things going on there. Uh, an ancient geographer uh, called Ephesus the market uh, of Asia, the market of Asia. And uh, in addition, <coughs> excuse me, Ephesus was uh, um, the highway of Rome. When Rome needed to go into that area, Rome came to Ephesus. When Rome was leaving that area, it came through Ephesus. And so Ephesus welcomed Rome, the Roman Empire, the Roman rulers, and all those that would come. And, and so it was a highway for Rome to go anywhere into that area of Turkey. And in later days, after this time when this letter was written, uh, Christians would be brought down those roads, taken through Ephesus, and into the harbor and boarded on ships to take, be taken to Rome and thrown in the Colosseum with lions. That one, one uh, uh, bishop, the bishop of Antioch, his name was Ignatius, he called Ephesus the highway of the martyrs. Because so many Christians were brought down those highways, taken to Rome and made sport of. Ephesus means darling. It's a maiden of choice, <clears throat> famous for its uh, being a cultural and, and economic uh, center in a, in a region. And its population, this blows my mind, its population at the time is probably about 250,000, uh, somewhere between 250,000 on the low side to some say 400 to 500,000 on the high side. That is a tremendous amount of people in, in a culture of that time and you think of just the f food, they didn't have a Walmart, uh, the sanitation, you know, those kinds of things <clears throat> that we just sort of take for granted. I can't imagine that many people in, in a city um, fairly close together of that size. So it just as a point of reference, I think Knoxville has around 200,000 people. So you're talking about Ephesus being anywhere from larger than Knoxville to twice its size, really approaching the size of maybe the Nashville. And uh, just as a point of reference for us. So it was, it was one of the uh, largest cities in the, in the Mediterranean. Uh, there, there was a church right in Ephesus. You go 250 to 400,000 people. And all of this culture and all of this uh, access to all of these other places you go, what a great place for a church. What a great place to, to um, speak into uh, society, to have access to so many people. Uh, Paul uh, took Priscilla and Killa, and they started a church there at Ephesus on his second missionary journey. So it would have been about 52 A.D. So about 52, you know, that's, that's a, a close to 20 years after Christ was crucified and resurrected. So 20 years after that is when Paul... Uh, has a missionary journey, plants the church there. He took time, Paul took time to preach at the synagogue, and then he left Priscilla and Aquila there, and Apollos joined them, and he was ministering there. 
<coughs> Paul came back in about 54 to uh, 54 AD, a couple years later on his next missionary journey, and that's when he spent a couple years there. And uh, and then Timothy would later become pastor. After uh, Timothy is probably where John uh, uh, stepped in as a sort of pastor of that area, bishop of some kind of that area of churches. And you go, this thing has a heritage of Paul planting it, of all of these people in Timothy, and Paul gave it so much attention that he stayed there a couple years, and and there was so much going on. And you go, this must have been a very vibrant and strong and active church. But the fact of the matter is, is it was a stronghold of Satan. I mean, it was so much evil and superstition and, and satanic things and demonic things that were practiced there that it was really a, a hotbed of sorcery and other ungodly and, and uh, immoral and forbidden, uh, what we would consider those forbidden acts. All this stuff was very plentiful there and accepted in that place. Ephesus was, as I said, a major cultural and economic center but it was also a center for religion. And unfortunately, much of the religion was evil religion. All of, the, all of the temples and all of these gods and goddesses and even the worship of the uh, emperors uh, of, of Rome was so prevalent there that the church is sort of was a, uh, in the background, almost, uh, almost underground. I mean, it was present, but it was so hard for them to operate in that that situation and and you know you think in that context of that what was going on in that society and how hard that must have been in the church and, and I think we sort of get a little glimpse of what might be coming to us when it's so hard for the church to operate and and we still have the freedom in our state and and um, there's just many places that are just getting hammered and uh, and they you know that that church we were praying for in California now is facing fines up to $700,000 for having church. And it's just getting c- crazy and the, the pressure coming to bear on, on, these, on these churches. And so I think it gives us a glimpse. And so it makes this so much more relevant to us as we look at some of these uh, situations. Uh, Ephesus was probably known uh, <clears throat> more uh, famous for the Temple of Artemis or uh, the Temple of Diana, Diana, the sort of the names change uh, across time, but uh, in probably in that time that this letter was written, it was probably known as the Temple of Diana. Um, this temple made Ephesus uh, really the capital city of paganism. Um, Diana was a fertility goddess worshipped uh, with, uh, uh, let's see, it's a, it's a moral sex, and uh, there was um, once a, a famous philosopher who said that no one could live in Ephesus without weeping at its immorality. It just give you a, a sense of what that culture looked like, of what that city looked like, of what's going on, that anybody with a common sense of decency would look at what was going on in society and just really be make them sick. Well, I can relate to that, and I, and I think you probably can too. When we begin to look at some of the stuff that's accepted as normal in our culture, and at the point where common and decent people speak out against it and they are trashed and and called bigots and whatever else because you have a moral boundary, a, a moral boundary that was given to us by our, our God. The this temple was an amazing structure. There was uh, 127 pil- pillars. They say each pillar was a uh, donated by a king, so each pillar was sort of stood as a representative of the king, probably had a king's name on it, 127 pillars, each of them 60 feet tall. And it was 425 by 220. So if you go 425 by 220, that is probably uh, bigger than this parking lot out here and probably goes from the front of the building across the street uh, at least. 127 columns, 60 feet tall, and, and built, and, and this was already like, um, the temple was 650 years old when John wrote this letter. That's how long this had been around. That had been rebuilt, restored. Uh, I think it had been uh, damaged a few times in wars and things like that. Um, but 
uh, for the most part, it had been around for 650 years. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and it also served as a major bank. So kings came from all over the area and, and brought their treasure to this, and, uh, and thinking that it was being watched over by this goddess. Um, the, uh, the merchants of the city of Ephesus made little trinkets because people came from all over those places where all those roads came through. And they made little trinkets, and little trinkets were were little things and the, you know, emblems of Diana and and things that they would, you know, hold on to. And she would, you know, this this goddess was supposed to make them fertile to have kids or heal all their woes or you know whatever it was. They made little trinkets and uh, baubles and things that they would wear like jewelry and things like that. And good luck charms and uh, and sort of am amulets. I guess the amulets or something like that in the I think that's the right word I'm trying to think of, of witchcraft or sorcery. And so the culture was really deeply rooted in this evil and this, you can imagine this temple up on high in view of the city, just sort of overlooking this city of, uh, of uh, a few hundred thousand people that uh, in, in the midst of that was a church. And the culture deeply, so deeply rooted in evil, so that they saw these things as very normal. That the things of the Lord were were uh, an anomaly, were weird, were considered strange and and uh, and ignored, dismissed. Uh, the pagan merchants didn't mind the existence of the church. There were, uh, as I said, many idols, many religions up and down the road, and and they didn't mind as long as no one interfered with the worship of Diana, with the main temple with. It was almost like uh, anything goes as long as you don't interfere with the main thing to them, the main thing being that worship of Diana. Such a big source of, of touristry, of, of their craftsmen making things, these trinkets and baubles that had so much an effect on their culture that they didn't want anybody messing with that. We see when the seven sons of Sceva got whipped by a demon, uh, all the city heard of it. This was from Acts 19.14. Uh, and they were overpowered. They ran away naked. The people of the city became fearful and they repented and they confessed their sins. And, and from that fallout of that event, they brought their books of magic and they burned them out in, in the open. Demetrius, we know a little bit about, if you remember the name Demetrius, one of these craftsmen that made these little trinkets, that made these little charms, of Diana that uh, made so much money off of uh, off of this temple, he he didn't like this whole idea of repentance, and it was bad for his business. He began to stir up the the uh, uh, crowd, he began to stir up the mob. And he said, "What man is there who does not know that the city of Ephesians is a uh, temple guardian of the great goddess Diana, and the image which fell down from Zeus? Who doesn't know that?" And why would anybody say anything different? Why would anybody repent and do all this other crazy stuff? This image fell down from Zeus in their mind. This image fell down from Zeus. And if an image fell down from Zeus, we should worship it. That was his view. And of course, that protected his business also. There's some historical information, this image, about this image. Uh, and, and it was really considered one of the most sacred images in the ancient world. But the thing is, it wasn't beautiful by any stretch of the imagination. It was described by one as a squat, black, many-breasted figure. There was a lot. Of, there was at least some uh, uh, thought that this was a a meteorite stone that was left. They said that this thing didn't resemble a person in any way. It's sort of like one of those. I, want to, I can't think of artists. The paintings where you sort of had to figure out was that, what is that? <clears throat> that's sort of what it sounded like. It, but it was a, uh, some believe it was a man-made image. It really, the, the whole story was, whatever it was, that it was uh, considered sacred. And, and it became famous to the point where nobody questioned what it was, where it came from, or the power behind it. And over time, it gained this reputation, and it just solidified over time which all of this was really good for the business of Demetrius and those type of people. 
and it was really became so ancient, nobody knows for sure where it came from. So Demetrius gets obviously stirred up at, at anybody speaking out against this, and, it, and Demetrius uh, stirs up this mob, and they go to the theater, and it holds about 25,000 people, and they're, they're looking for Paul. They're going to they're gonna rip him limb from limb for stirring this up. And, and, and Paul was spared by the mob, and uh, you know, in a short time later, as Paul is on his way back to, um, to Israel, uh, really to Antioch, I think, and he, he returned a short time, passed by Ephesus, didn't go in the city because it's probably too dangerous, called the elders out to himself. And this is what he says. Because of the city of Ephesus, he understood the culture of Ephesus, lived there a few years, really ran for his life, escaped when that mob came to get him. He comes back a little while, he calls the elders together. And amongst all that he said, he said this. This comes from Acts 20. Uh, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things, uh, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember, watch and remember, remember. And for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears, constantly warning them about what was going on in the culture and what was on around them, that savage wolves would come, not just coming from the outside, not just trying to beat the door down to have their way as wolves to eat the sheep, but also from those that would be within the church, that some of this threat would come from within the church speaking perverse things. People would rise up within the church and draw them away. Paul then wrote to the Ephesians in 62 A.D., so the church was started in 52. He went back 54 to 56. It's now 62 A.D. that uh, he writes back to Ephesus. Uh, it is uh, possible that John went to um, uh, that John went to Ephesus around 66 A.D. So when uh, Paul wrote, he wrote to Timothy, wrote to the Ephesians around 62. John looks like he was there about 66. And so now it's about 96 when he's writing this, so it's another 30 years later. So now it's about, uh, if he's writing this letter to him in 95 or 96 A.D., so it's like 60 years after Jesus is gone. And I think of 60 years in the life of a church. I think of the church I grew up in, and... uh, I'm not old enough to think back 60 years, but I can think back 50 years, and I can tell you how much and how radical a change. More importantly, (laughs) what's really on my mind this week, is the passing of all of those people that I remember as a child seeing, sitting in those pews, those that were the anchors of that church those that were the elders and the deacons, those that, that uh, supported and loved and sacrificed for that church no matter what. And you see, as those have passed away over the years, what is, who has stepped into those places? Who has, who has risen up to that? We seem to be a culture of people that don't want that responsibility, don't want that They don't want that responsibility of being there and and being the one, that anchor point. But they want access. I mean, they kind of want to treat it like an emergency room. I'll just run to the emergency room when when things fall apart. But otherwise, it's just, if, if I go, I go. If I don't, I don't. But it's supposed to be a home place, a A family with people loving on each other, supporting each other, ministering to each other. And if we're a body, and the body is missing parts, half the time, how healthy can a body be? 
If we are a body and we all have a calling to operate together and function together in that calling, but half of the body is not operating that calling, how healthy can the church be? 60 years. So my first, as I study this, you go, how can they have had such a such a um, solid beginning in a heritage in Paul and in John, in Apollos, in Priscilla and Achilla, and, and had such a solid foundation in such a it's to build a foundation like that in that culture it, 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 they had to have such a, a good start how did they how did they lose their first love and then I, I began to look we've lost so much of the church in, in this day has lost their first love to where you so many are call themselves churches don't even use a bible anymore They've taken the Bibles out because they don't want to fit any. They've pulled the crosses down because they just want to be a light in the community and, I don't know, read Hallmark cards together or sing Kumbaya. I don't know. It's this social, you know, let's just all have something warm and fuzzy together instead of the Word of God. And uh, it hasn't been that long, you know. It's in my lifetime I've seen this radical change. And so when I look at this and go, in 30 years um, from the time this was really strong, 60 years after Christ had was crucified and raised again, 30, 30 years after the church was planted there in Ephesus that they um, received this letter that they left their first love. Um, there's no doubt that this was a perfect place. That, um, the darkness was so prominent, and so it was a, a beautiful place for a church, and uh, really a place uh, to feed the truth to starving souls. And you know, there was just a lot of starving souls, people searching for answers, searching for something solid, unchanging, something to hold on to, something that was eternal, that something that every person feels in their heart, where the uh, because they each person is created in the image of God, no matter where they walk, how they walk, that everybody feels that to some degree, and it's only in repentance and faith in Christ and being born again in the Spirit that satisfies that, and finally just ah, that's it. That satisfies that brings that contentment and that joy that is beyond anything our circumstances could offer in this world. So uh, John pens this letter um, really playing secretary for the Lord Jesus. And he says to to the angel, remember the angels uh, a a literally just means messenger and probably is speaking about a human in this but it wouldn't rule out that it's an angel I, 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 but you know really I look at the way John has used that word and John used it that word so many times he used it speaking of angels but in the culture in the way that word is used you, you have to think it was, it was probably a human messenger or or even the pastor of the church so it's to the angel of this church the messenger of this church and he, and, he, and he says, this is from he who um, walks in the midst of the seven lampstands. It's one of the titles of Christ is he who walks in the midst uh, and then holds these seven stars. And so this isn't, um, you know, you've got to picture these seven lampstands are the seven churches, representative of the churches of the age. And, and Jesus is amongst them, walking amongst them, tending to them because uh, he is the light of those lampstands. Those lampstands are simply a, a, a utility function of holding a light up. They just hold the light up. They aren't the light. That Jesus Christ is that light. And it is these churches become, a, a use this, this function, this, I keep wanting to call it a utility of 
of being the, the tool that holds the light up. And so the Lord Jesus is tending to these seven lampstands. He's in the midst and he walks around and, and he holds the seven uh, stars. And if you, if you remember right at the end of chapter 1, he seven the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Again, probably those pastors, those leaders. That he holds them in his hands. That he keeps them. And uh, that's a special title. Um, particularly if you're sitting in a chair like this. If you are a pastor, it's just to, to know that he holds you in, in, in that way. And you go, if, if the Lord is tending those seven lambs, if he holds that, that pastor, that bishop, elder, whatever it was in that culture, or maybe many of them in his hands, had they forgotten that? It is easy to forget. You get caught up in the, the day-to-day function and through all that is going on and, and the turmoil of the community, of the things that are going on in the world, and it's so easy to sort of, um, sort of let that slip away. Did they, did they sort of forget that Jesus in our presence when we worship? Do, do we remember that this is about Jesus Christ? That this is not your church or my church in, a, in the way that it is His church first, that He is the head of this church. That we are simply a lampstand and He allows us to be part of that. And what an amazing thing. And so the first point uh, that I want to want you to hold on to today is that he is in our midst this is a message for us one uh, thing to pull from this and there's so many different ways and so many different points and i tried to keep it to three and be a good pastor but i got four so i apologize it was like three and a bonus so point one is he is in our midst and that is so important when you get to verse two then in this letter is the commendation. And and he says to every church, I know your works. And so if he is in our midst, he knows our works. Now this is not just to say, I know that you guys packed 400 shoe boxes and you're pretty spanky for doing so. But but did you do it for commendation? Did you do it for pat on the back? Did you do it with the right heart? Did you take part in it because... You wanted to extend that grace and that love to someone else. That you wanted to make a gift of love to someone that you couldn't reach any other way. This is what it means that He knows our works. And He knows our heart. He knows why we did what we do and when we do and when we fail to do what we should have done. When that opportunity came our way, we were just too busy with other things. He knows our works. He knows the labor, the, the, the toil, the effort. He, he knows the difficulty that we've gone through. So the difficulty may be that there was a sacrifice made. Somebody said, you know, instead of spending this money on myself, I, I think I'm going to spend that on, on something to help someone, to give someone, to, to minister to someone. It could be. Instead of spending my time on the things that I want to do, I'm going to extend myself and, and call someone and love on someone that I know is lonely and in need. The labor and the toil is, is the difficulty and the, uh, uh, the real effort that has been put forth. The real effort that is put, not what is just maybe visible to others or not visible to others. That we aren't to judge the works of anyone else, but our King of Kings can see our hearts. He sees our labor. He sees our toil. And then He sees our patience, which is the same word we talked about last week, this steadfast endurance, this perseverance, this um, not, not sort of, gee, we're just sort of hanging out here until Jesus comes back. I hope things don't get too bad. You know, it's sort of like, that's not the patience of, but this is a, a courageous, a, a steadfast endurance. And we're going to be about the business of Jesus. 
and I believe he's coming back soon. And But if he's not, he's still in the midst of us. I don't care what goes on. I keep wanting to talk about governors and viruses, and I'm trying desperately not to, but steadfast endurance that that that's not it's truthfully it's not steadfast endurance unless of course things get really bad it's not steadfast endurance unless a uh, uh, demetrius says hey you, you can't you can't talk like that it's not steadfast endurance unless when the governor says uh, you, you can't meet it is steadfast endurance no matter what because that's what jesus called us to Walking and thriving as a believer. Passing through this life on our way to heaven. Citizens of another world. Passing through amongst the citizens of this world. He says, I know your works and your labor and your your patience. And I know that you have no tolerance from evil. Now this evil isn't like a Stephen King evil. It's not like fangs and not like Stephen King dreams or whatever. This is, this, is, this is the unrighteous acts of normal people. This is the evil I spoke of in the midst of the culture of Ephesus, of the, of the immoral and unethical uh, things that were so normal in that society that they would not and could not tolerate those things. But it made them sick, as that one man said. There's no tolerance from evil. And in this case, he says, that there were some that came in amongst you in the evil act of act, acting as if they were apostles. They don't really know what this means. Did somebody come in and, and claim to be, uh, you know, Matthew's uh, long-lost cousin that I'm, I've now inherited his apostleship? They don't know if this was people coming in claiming some heritage of, of, of relation to those that they were now apostles, if they were like Paul saying that uh, Paul was an apostle after the apostles. And that they were saying, well, we're like Paul that Jesus called us. And, but, the, but the truth of the matter is, is that they came in and said they were apostles. And, and they came with a message. An apostle is one that comes with a message. But they tested them and found out to be liars. Now, what do you think that test sounded like? In 1 John, John put it this way. He says, who, who, he who says... I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. In, in 1 John 2.22 says, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So, so many of these so-called apostles, these messengers, these people of the message that traveled in the church of that day, they would claim something about Jesus, but they would separate him from the Father from the spirit they might separate the physical jesus from the spiritual jesus and they and they played all kinds of games with this and the people at ephesus would have no part in those games we know the gospel truth the father the son and the holy spirit that god the father sent his son and he came and he died on the cross for our sins he was raised again the third day ascended to heaven sat down at the right hand of god and he's coming again And until that day comes, He sent us the Holy Spirit to walk with us, to be the presence of Jesus in our life. And Ephesians says, don't be talking any out of bounds of those things. We won't stand for it. We can learn from that. Because there's so many, as hard as it is to imagine, so many that are partying from that very thing. Verse 3 says they persevered and they had patience and they labored for the, for the name of Jesus, for the sake of Jesus. They didn't grow weary. They, they, weary means they, didn't, they, didn't, they haven't done this to the point of exhaustion. And I don't think that's a criticism, although it could be. But I think it's actually a commendation that you've worked and you've labored and you've have you not grown weary? And I think you don't grow weary because you're doing it in the Spirit of God, that you're led by the Spirit. I think it's when we, we work out a compulsion and, and we're working outside of our calling. 
when we're running ahead of God or we're running apart from God or we're doing things of the flesh and, and we're just going to take care of ourselves and we make church some social function instead of worship and honoring God and keeping Christ at the center and at the head of this church. When you remove all those things, you, you grow weary. When you're no longer empowered by the Spirit because you're out of bounds, Man, it'll it'll grind you to it'll grind you up. And so that they didn't grow weary, I think, is a is an indication that the Holy Spirit was they were being led by the Spirit in this church. Verse four then brings a chastening. He chastens whom he whom he loves. And he said that this church has left their first love. How do you how do you how do you leave your first love? How, you, you have to think this was an accident. They didn't have a committee meeting and say, uh, you know what, something's got to go. We're too busy. Let's, let's kick God out. I mean, there, there's nothing, there's, there's no reasonable thought that thinks anybody would do this on purpose. So if this can happen when they weren't looking, if this could just sort of slip away, if, if in a matter of 30 years, when Paul was present and he's speaking, he leaves these elders behind, even warns them of what's going to happen. If this can happen to a church at Ephesus that had such a, a rich heritage, it can happen here. How does that happen? Well, do, you, do you look at the pastor and you go, well, he, he must have messed up? Do you look at the leadership and go, not very good leadership, that must be it? Or do you look at the people? Is it everybody? Did it become acceptable? Because, well, I don't want to say anything because I don't want anybody mad at me. Or I don't want to, I don't want to minister to anybody. I don't want to say anything out loud. Who am I? The Lord offers a chastening that they left the first love. What is this, what is this first love? I think the first love of any church has got to be God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The first love is the love of God. Our love of God then is also displayed by our love for our brothers and sisters. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, John said. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So the two go hand in hand. If you love God, there has to be present a love for your brother, for your sister. How did they lose it? We're not really sure, but again, I go to 1 John because he was so concerned about these things. 1 John 2, he says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Did the Ephesians fall in love with the world? The world around them? The things of the world? Did they celebrate the culture and the thriving city that they lived in? Did they enjoy the things that were present in that culture? So many of them born uh, from a wicked place. How much of what we do could we say the same thing about? Did they just fail to keep the main thing the main thing? And they tend to think is maybe the new war off of, of, a, of a new church and a new relationship with God and the excitement of, of that newness and the new war off, but they failed to step into that place where they deepen and grow that relationship with the Lord. There's an infinite, infinite richness found in our infinite God the infinite knowledge of Him 
you never just arrive at that place, but you would just continue to grow and experience Him. And so my second point, and they'll come quicker now, I know. <laughs> the second point is that works are, are not a relationship. The works do not maintain that love. Works are a result of that love. The works come as a result of the richness of the love. That we love Him so much and we recognize what He's done for us. We just want to serve Him. We want to be like Him. We want to experience Him in every aspect of our life. Works are not a relationship, and I think there's indication that the very best, the very best can fail at this thing we have to guard it all starts individually to guard it as a church it starts with you in your home in your prayer life in your devotions and so the remedy verse 5 what is the remedy how do we get this back how did it was Ephesians the uh, church in Ephesus supposed to get it back well it started with remembering they were to remember remember Maybe the great joy of knowing that your sins are forgiven. This remembering reminds me just when we when we together as a group go to the table and, and share in the Lord's Supper together, and we do that in remembrance of Him, right? It's the very thing Paul said when he was leaving those Ephesian elders. He said, Remember. Remember the great joy of knowing your sins forgiven. Remember when you first understood the idea of grace? I could tell you the place. I could go show you the very place. I could nail it down to the time. See, just like a light coming on that I understood how special, precious, and amazing this grace was, which was to understand the depth of your own depravity. You have to understand how depraved you are and sinful you are before you truly understand how amazing God's grace is. Maybe it was to remember how you used to spend time in His Word. Not in a hurry, not setting a clock and the alarm clock and go, well, I'm going to grab 10 minutes of Bible before my movie starts or whatever it may be. Just spending time in God's Word, in His presence. Remember how he used to pray with power, with authority, pleading the blood of Christ. Remember the joy of getting together with other believers. Maybe remembering how excited you used to be to tell others about what Jesus did in your life. The instruction was to repent. Remember. Remember first. Because they had fallen. This, this uh, lose, losing their first love was a fall. It was uh, the picture of being in a, in a place where they worshiped the Lord, where they, the Lord had them in this place, and they had fell by leaving that first love. And so they need to repent and return to this place. Turn around and agree with God. Turn around and agree with Christ. Yes, we have. We don't know how. I can't, it doesn't matter. Only in the sense that it, I want to make sure it doesn't happen again. Repent, turn around, agree with God. At any time we discover that we're separated, God, the first act is to return to the place you last knew Him. The last place you were in His presence, you experienced Him. Go back to that place. And then from there, return to the place you best knew Him. He'll guide you. Then figure out how you got separated so you don't do it again. And I think if I could sum all that up, that would be my third point. To sum all that up and to say, be engaged with God. Be engaged with Him. Endeavor to explore the depths of the, uh, of the infinity of God. The depths of His knowledge and His wisdom. 
to put yourself at his, at his call. To say, God, what would you have me do today? And be obedient to that. And when he shows you, it's, it's scary sometimes, right? Everybody's like, but if he asked me to do that, that's hard, and I don't know how. And He's God. He can help you. He, you know, he, he, if he gives you one of these things, you say, God, I, God, God, I got no clue, but Lord, I'll step. And really, I, I, I see that as, as, as extending our faith. That our faith is like where the light is turned on, but uh, beyond this, it's, it's, it's like dark. And, and I don't know what's out there, and so I'm afraid to go there. But the Lord is in our midst, and it says, the Lord says, come on, step. And as you step into what seems darkness, the light comes on, and He shows you, and He... And he a, a new aspect of your life and your faith has grown and it is the pain and, and the uh, experiences of life that lead you into those dark places that you've never been before we call them a test of our faith the test is not God finding out if your faith is real it's God showing that your faith is more real than you have ever imagined be engaged with God. And then you see this or else. It's got to be one of the scariest things. You can't continue to be a lamp, a whole light, if you don't know the light. You can't continue to be a church and do things your own way. You're not going to be a church anymore. That if you continue down this path, it was just going to become a slippery slope to where nothing they were doing had honored God in any way. And so the or, L L or else is very frightening words, but, but in order for them to continue, they had to turn around and come back to that first love in order to maintain their position as a lampstand for the light of Jesus Christ. Verse 6, he says, speaks of these Nicolaitans. And I don't want to, there's so much about these Nicolaitans and so much of speculation. And, and you can read all day and you will not know any more than you know right now about the Nicolaitans. They were, they were people, they were people that um, were throwing other Christians off their moral and ethical boundaries. And, and they, they were making a, um, doing this within the church, right? And so they became a sect within the church that, that said, oh, you guys, you don't have to worry about those, all these moral issues. And, and this is really consistent with some of the Gnostics that would say, your spirit is saved in Jesus, but when you go out the door, go do whatever you want, and have fun, enjoy life. Right? We hear all that kind of stuff today. And it's sort of the idea, well, God wants you happy, right? Well, does he? Is it really all that important to God that you're happy all the time? These guys, in my mind, are sort of the forerunners of TV preachers. They're all about money, and they don't care who they consume on the way. They will steal from every uh, widow, from every the last penny to add to their millions. Arrhenius said... Uh, the Nicolaitans are characterized by their promiscuity and eating things offered to idols. Promiscuity, no moral boundaries. Stumbling stone for other believers. Eusebius stated it, uh, essentially the same thing. He said there was a tradition that Nicol uh, Nicholas was, had a beautiful wife, was jealous uh, of her, and so he renounced all relations with her, but he took part in illicit pleasure with anybody and everything else. Tertullian spoke of uh, uh, Nicolaitans as being a type of agnostic, which is kind of what I just said. And Neander uh, considered them antinomianism, antinomians, uh, those rejecting uh, traditional moral boundaries. This is sort of a heretical sect within Christianity. So you could read on and on about the Nicolaitans. But they were 
they were causing a problem. And it became very evident. These are one of the evil that came in the midst of the, of the Ephesians. And Ephesians, Ephesians said, not here. And they hated the deeds. They didn't hate the people. We're supposed to be loving to even our enemies. They hated the deeds. They hated the deeds of this place because the deeds drew away from the glory of, of, a, of the Lord. And the Lord says, I hate their deeds also. Hated what the Lord hated. That's a good thing. It brings us to verse 7. For he who has ear, uh, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes. So to him who has the ear is to anyone. This is speaking to humanity. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So this is my fourth point. My bonus point. There are no part-time overcomers. You either are or you aren't. Too many people put their church life and their calling and their faith on hold to pick it up another day when it's convenient or when a virus goes away or whatever it may be. Well, next it'll be persecution, maybe the election, a virus. What's next? Well, there's always be something. There's always something, right? Because life stinks. It isn't convenient. It's a fallen world. There's always something in the way. And too many people put in their church life their relationship with the Lord and the calling that's on every person that's in the church that considers themselves to be born again. It's as if they could just set it aside and pick it back up later. God's commands are not nullified by the things that happen in and around our culture, around our lives. The calling placed in your life can't be thrown off or set aside. The ministry you're supposed to be offer, uh, offering your brothers and sisters or those in the culture, that's on you to deliver. And probably more importantly, most important is that it's in the this season. It's in the season of suffering. It's in the season of persecution, just like in Ephesus. It's in that season when that that our faith is, needs to be the light in a community. Others are looking for that hope. They're looking for that answer. Looking for something solid, something to grab onto. We should be the ones saying, right here. We can tell you where it's at. We know Him. It's Jesus Christ. But He has the answers. There's something worse than getting sick. There's something worse than persecution. It's life without Christ. Because life without Christ is a life without hope. But even worse than that is death without Him is an unthinkable eternal hell. To him who overcomes, give to eat of the tree of life. The last you really saw of the tree of life was in Genesis. When Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden and a flashing sword was placed to guard the way. To him who overcomes, once again, access to that garden paradise of God. I want some of that. Ephesus is now a tourist attraction, an archaeological relic. The ruins of the theater are amazing. The circus, 
They used to have the uh, what was the equivalent of the Olympics in Asia right there. The biggest in the, in the area. It was amazing. Stadium was an amazing sight. Gives you a glimpse into their history. You can see what's left of the temples and the palaces that once drew honor and the wealth of the nations. And if you dig through the rubble and you look through all of the archaeological digs, there's not one shred of evidence that there was ever a church there. How is that possible? There's no evidence that the church of Ephesus heard this call to repent. It, is a, it appears the church became extinct there. Which is to say, if they didn't repent, the lampstand was removed from the midst of the Lord. Maybe this is the lesson for us in this day, in our time. Where and when the church fails, the culture fails. If we fail, if we fail to be the light, to be the stabilizing factor and the force in this community, in this United States and in this world, where the church fails, the culture fails. So let me close with this. Can you imagine? Someone pulling a letter that says, Dear Calvary Chapel Sweetwater, I know your works. What would it say? What would it say to you? Would there be criticism? Would you be surprised by any of it? No church should be need a letter from Jesus Christ. You already sent it. You already have it. No church should need a letter from Christ. For the very act of calling ourselves a church, Jesus should be at the center led by the Spirit, in constant communication with the Lord. And so He is in our midst. Our works are not a relationship. The relationship starts with each individual. We are to be engaged with God, endeavor to explore the depths, the infinite beauty of our Lord. There's no part-time overcomers. You either in or you aren't. Across the ages, Jesus charged the church to hold fast to timeless gospel truth, teach the scriptures, reject false teaching, and live a life consistent to the first two.